Yeah, welcome everyone. Then this is the last talk of uh, this uh, workshop. It is, uh, the talk will be low cost tax on Ethereum 2.0, sub 1 over 3 stakeholders. The speaker will be Michael Nilda. Let's welcome Michael, please. Thank you. And thanks to Zhao Te and Jing for organizing this workshop. So to provide a bit of context for this work, I thought I would introduce Ethereum 2 Beacon Chain, which was actually just launched December 1st, so only 10 days ago. And this is a really big part of the kind of modern version of Ethereum that's being launched and has been highly anticipated over the past couple of years. So the fact that it launched is very exciting. And <clears throat> we see already that approximately 1 million Ether or around 500 million US dollars have been staked. So Ethereum 2 implements a proof of stake consensus protocol and that's what we'll be studying. So we're already seeing a really great community participation in the network. Additionally, we're seeing high validator participation in the consensus, which means stakers are not only putting their money down, but they're also you know, producing blocks and, and participating in the proof of stake system. So everything looks good so far, and hopefully this emphasizes why it's so important that we are studying the security properties of this, of this system. So the contributions of this paper are as follows. We outline two attacks that can be launched against the Ethereum 2.0 beacon chain. The first attack allows an attacker to execute malicious reorgs, and the second, which delays finality. And we'll define and um, ex expand on each of these attacks throughout this talk. Secondly, we demonstrate that for a 30% stake attacker, these attacks are feasible and cheap. And this 30% number is relevant because the stated security threshold for the beacon chain is that no attacker controls more than one third of the total stake. So we show that a sub one third stake attacker can still launch these attacks in, with, with high probability and for relatively cheap. So now I'll present a little intuition about each of the attacks just to kind of foreshadow what's gonna come up. If, if this doesn't make sense, don't worry, that's what the rest of the talk is for. So for malicious reorgs, the intuition is that the fork choice rule in uh, Ethereum 2.0 decides between conflicting blocks with the same parent by seeing which block has more votes. So this can be thought of as like a heaviest chain, for example, um, in, in the case where two blocks have the same parent, just choose whichever has more votes. And in the course of producing blocks, an attacker can create a private fork during which the honest validators who have to cast a vote will have to vote for a parent block to the attacker's private fork. And this is because they haven't seen the private fork, so all they know is, is the parent block. And what this allows is the validator to use multiple sets of their own votes for their private chain and outweigh the next honest blocks that are produced because half of the honest votes during that time period were sent to a parent block of the attacker fork instead of to a conflicting leaf block. So, Again, we'll, we'll outline this more detail in the, in the next slides. So why does the malicious rear attack matter? Well, a couple things. It offers an attacker a potential to double spend transactions. And <clears throat> double spend is a situation in which an attacker sends a transaction that they plan to delete immediately through the use of a reorg. And that's a property that's um, really non-desirable for, for a crypto economic system. Second, it provides an opportunity to front run transactions. And front running is a situation in which an attacker uses information about transaction ordering to create short-term arbitrage opportunities. So the second attack we present is called delaying finality. And intuition here is slightly different. So to, in order to achieve finality, there's what's called a finality gadget. And this gadget operates on special checkpoint blocks. And in order to finalize new blocks, two thirds of the validators have to agree on one of these checkpoint blocks. So if the attacker is the block proposer for a checkpoint block, then they can delay its release 
in order to ensure that two thirds threshold is not met. So the, the same intuition here is, is that the attacker is creating these blocks in private and delaying their release in order to achieve um, a malicious outcome. So the impact of delaying finality are, are slightly different. So the reorg attacks have an opportunity to gain or like a financial opportunity for the attacker, whereas this attack is more of a attack on the system as a whole. So what this operates as is a denial of service attack on the finalization mechanism. And it really leads to a less predictable network and, and may be aimed at degrading user trust in the system and impacting the health of the network as a whole. A quick note on related work. This work is largely inspired by the proof of work selfish mining literature, as well as the longest chain proof of stake selfish mining literature. <clears throat> Further, there are <clears throat> a number of attacks presented on the beacon chain, including ebb and flow, decoy flip flop, and bouncing attack. Our attacks aim to accomplish similar things as these attacks, but basically in, in a completely different method. And one interesting note is that these attacks two and three here have been addressed by the Ethereum Foundation in the protocol spec. And those fixes don't actually have any impact on our attacks. So if you want more inf information on that, check out the paper. So now I will outline a bit about the proof of stake basics for Ethereum 2.0. This is important to lay the groundwork so we're all on the same page when we understand um, how the attacks work. So in, in Ethereum proof of stake, time is divided into epochs, which consist of 12 second slots. So we have 32 slots per epoch, and you can think of each slot as an opportunity for a block to be produced. And the block is produced by a member of the committee. So the people who have stake in the system are partitioned into a set of committees. Each, <clears throat> each validator will only belong to one committee and each committee has a single proposer and many attesters. And attesters are people who are casting or validators who are casting votes for the blocks that they're seeing. And one important note is that though each slot represents a block creation opportunity, there's no guarantee that a block will be produced at each slot. So we see at slot zero, the Genesis block is created, but then at slot one, the proposer seems to be offline. So they didn't produce a block. So then we label this block as block height one, even though it belongs to slot two. <clears throat> so this will be important when we discuss the attacks. So yeah, proposers create blocks and the attesters vote on the blocks that were just created. Further, validators are rewarded for participating in the, in the protocol. So <clears throat> this incentivizes people to, to stake ether and to participate actively in the consensus. Currently, they're rewarded about 14% annually, so a quite good return on investment. So <clears throat> moving to specifically the consensus mechanism, it's a combination of two ideas. A fork choice rule, which I alluded to earlier, which is called HLMD Ghost, and a finality tool, which is called Casper, the friendly finality gadget. And <clears throat> the each of our two attacks is targeted at one of these two um, com uh, one of these two ideas. So <clears throat> the um, the fork choice rule, which is called HLMD Ghost, operates as follows. It uses weight to determine the head of the canonical chain, and weight is defined as the number of attestations to that block itself or to one of the one of its uh, children blocks. So in this figure here, we have basically three generations of blocks. This is like the grand grandparent block, the parent block, and the children block. So this block is annotated with 12 because it has four attestations to itself, four to its children, and four to its grandchildren. So that's kind of how these numbers are, are derived. And the ghost rule operates by taking the heavier fork at each branch. So in this case, there's a branch between five and three so five is chosen. In this case, there's a branch between three and one, so three is chosen. And this pattern continues until a leaf block is reached. A leaf block just means a block with no children. And that block will be seen as the head of the canonical chain. 
So in this case, the blue blocks represent the canonical chain. So now we can <clears throat> formally define attestation. And an attestation is really a vote containing three pieces of information, a source and target epoch boundary block, and the head of the chain according to HLMP ghost. So for this discussion now, we only need to consider A3, which is the result of running HLMD ghost. So they run the, the honest validators will run the algorithm from the previous slide to determine which block to sign at A3. So now we can define our first attack, which is called malicious reorgs. And first, it's helpful to think about what reorgs are in the first place. And reorgs occur when a conflicting block is determined to be do dominant over the existing canonical chain. So <clears throat> this, <clears throat> excuse me, this can happen <clears throat> in, um, in proof of work in the following situation. Say blocks A and B were produced at approximately the same time. Then, <clears throat> yeah, grab a sip of tea real quick. <clears throat> then the honest miners will partition between mining on block A and block B. Now assume a block A prime is mined on A before any block is mined on B. Then the honest miners who are using the longest chain for choice rule will drop this block and only mine on top of A prime. So in this way, block B is orphaned and essentially deleted from the view of the honest validators, honest miners. So how does this work in Ethereum proof of work? So consider this situation. We have a block at slot N, it's produced, and there's four attestations to it. This is the A3 component of the attestation. Now the attacker privately proposes block N plus one and attests privately that A3 equals N plus one. So that's represented by this gray circle here. Now, during this slot, honest validators who haven't seen this block will continue to attest that block N is the head of the chain. And remember, block N is a parent of block N plus one. At slot N plus two, an honest validator will produce a block, but that block will have to be a child of block N because it hasn't seen the block N plus one. And the attacker will continue to attest to their private fork while the honest validators will now start to attest to the N plus two block. However, once the attacker releases their private attestations and block N plus one, N plus one is seen as the head of the chain by HLMD ghost. And we can verify that by just counting the number of attestations to the leaf blocks. So this N plus one has three attestations, N plus two has two, and they share a common parent. So in terms of our, <clears throat> we can abstract away all the other details and think about just our fork choice rule. <clears throat> and this is what we're presented with. And we see that indeed block N plus one would be the head of the canonical chain according to HLMD ghost. <clears throat> so this is how the attack unfolds. And the real, I guess the real takeaway is that during the attacker's private fork, the, these three honest attestations are wasted or not necessarily wasted, but they point to the an ancestor block of n plus one, which doesn't conflict with the weight of n plus one. So now we can examine the probability of this occurring. <clears throat> so we have probability and cost, both as a function of the length of the reorg. So we, we can read this as, as follows. Say we're examining this data point here. We say that a reorg of length three has a probability of occurring at about an hourly rate. And that same reorg would cost the attacker about two US dollars. So we got these probabilities through Monte Carlo simulation. And it's important to note here that we're only considering reorgs within a single epoch. So not concerned about uh, blocks that or reorgs that go across epoch boundaries. <clears throat> and cost here, is the amount of reward lost or the opportunity cost of playing a dishonest strategy. So this is different from selfish mining in that they won't earn extra rewards from the protocol itself, but they can earn rewards by attempting to front run or double spend transactions. And given that the reorg attacks are so cheap to launch, you know, on the order of five US dollars, <clears throat> basically any successful front runner reorg will be worthwhile. So now we can talk, work, work towards talking about our second um, attack. And before we describe it, it's helpful to 
kind of formalize what we mean by finality. And finality is a really important concept in Ethereum too, and it's a property of blocks. So Casper FFG is a gadget that operates on, a, on top of a blockchain and determines which blocks are finalized. So the, the rest of the consensus layer is responsible for producing blocks and determining which block is the head of the chain. And the finality gadget lives on top of those blocks and marks some as finalized. And an important result from this paper is that a finalized block will remain on the chain um, unless more than one third of the total stake is provably dishonest. And, and we won't go into details there, but basically that's a, that's a very strong result for from this paper. So how this works is the first block of the chain is finalized and the gadget moves monotonically up in block height using the checkpoint blocks. And the design rationale here is that it's much more efficient to use checkpoints rather than trying to finalize each block individually. <clears throat> so what we mean by checkpoint blocks is really defined as an epoch boundary block. And epoch boundary blocks can be thought of as representing the state of all the blocks within a specific epoch. And a honest validator determines an epoch boundary block by looking for the first block in an epoch. So remember there's 32 slots per epoch. So in this case, the slot 32 block was created. So for epoch one, block 32 is the epoch boundary block or the EBB. For epoch two, we would be looking for block 64, but since it's not there, <clears throat> the honest validators will borrow the highest slot block from a previous epoch. In this case, it'll be this block 63 from epoch one. So it'll be borrowed into epoch two to become the epoch boundary block there. So now we can kind of revisit our, our definition of attestation with this definition in hand. And an attestation again is a vote casting <clears throat> that contains a source and target epoch boundary block. So we can interpret an attestation with A1 equals beta and A2 equals gamma as meaning I want to move the finality gadget from epoch beta block, <clears throat> epoch boundary block beta to epoch boundary block gamma. And if two thirds of the validators attest with A1 equals beta and A2 equals gamma, then we say that a supermajority link is created and the gadget is moved. So we say if, if two thirds of the people want to move this gadget from, these, from this block to this block, then we do it. And this leads us to thinking more formally about justification and finalization. So justification is the first step in a finalization process. And the, so yeah, let's, let's start by analyzing this picture here. So for epoch zero, we have the Genesis block and it's finalized by default. And finalized is a stronger condition than justified. So every um, finalized block is also justified. And we have our Casper friendly ghost and this represents the gadget. So it, it's sitting on top of block zero. Over the course of epoch one, a supermajority link is created between block zero and 32. And so this means two thirds of the testers or two thirds of the validators say that they wanna move the gadget from block zero to block 32. So the gadget is moved and we can now define justification as a case where the gadget lands on an epoch boundary block. And that's represented by this yellow block here. Now, over the course of Epoch 2, another supermajority link is created, this time from 32 to 63. <clears throat> so the finality gadget is again moved. 63 becomes justified because the finality gadget landed on it <clears throat> from, definition, from the first part here. And we can define finalized as a situation in which the gadget is moved from the block, from that Epoch boundary block to the next Epoch's EBB. So in this case, it's moving from block 32 to 63, so the gadget left um, 32, making 32 finalized. So now we can, <clears throat> with all of this in hand, we can finally get to our second attack, which is called delaying finality. So again, similar situation to what we just saw in the previous slide. We have our 32 blocks from epoch zero, everything's as expected, and the finality gadget is initialized to block zero. Now consider the case where the attacker privately creates block 32, which is the epoch boundary block for epoch one. In this case, since this block is private, the honest attesters for slot 32, which are represented by these green circles here, they have to decide which epoch boundary block to use. 
since they haven't seen block 32, they instead go to the previous epoch and borrow block 31. So the honest attesters are claiming that A1 equals zero and A2 equals 32. And that's represented by this upper dashed line here. So they, they say, we wanna move the gadget from block zero to block 31 because they haven't seen the true epoch boundary block. Whereas the attacker is saying, no, I wanna move the gadget from block zero to block 32, which is the true epoch boundary block. Now consider the case where the attacker owns the proposal rights for the slot 33 block as well. So they privately create this block. And again, during this slot, the honest attesters who haven't seen any epoch boundary block for epoch one will continue to attest that, um, that the that uh, epoch boundary block should be block 31. So they'll continue attesting and saying, move the gadget from block zero to block 31. Now, when the attacker releases their private fork, block 33, which is the only leaf block, will be seen as the head of the canonical chain. So the next honest block will be mined on top or will be created on top of it. And for the remainder of the epoch, honest attesters will see that block 32 is the true EBB for epoch one. And thus they'll start voting for this bottom dashed arrow here. But the problem is the attacker has already wasted these five attestations and wasted by by wasted, I mean, it caused them to misidentify the epoch boundary block for epoch one. So the attacker wasted these five and withholds the rest of their own attestations. And thus a supermajority link is never created. And the gadget is never moved to block 31 nor block 32. So we can calculate this probability <clears throat> um, a little more directly than the previous probability. So again, I guess we can, we can read this plot similarly to before, except the x-axis in this case is a delay in terms of epochs instead of in terms of uh, uh, blocks. So we can read this as a finality delay of uh, a three epoch finality delay occurs at about an hourly rate for a 30% stake attacker. And this is quite a big deal because epochs are about 6.4 minutes each. So three epochs in a row is about 19 minutes of delaying finality per hour, which is you know, a, a, about one third of the total time. And cost is, is much higher for this attack. It's on the order of about 500 US dollars. But again, this attack is really aimed at damaging the network as a whole. So given the whole network value, these, these costs are still quite cheap. So a 30% attacker has about a, a 0.09 chance of forcing a non-justified epoch. And that 0.09 comes from the probability that they're the proposer for the epoch boundary block in the subsequent block. And the reason that has to, that number is two um, is, is quite an involved cal calculation and that's in appendix B of the paper. So I'll omit it for here. And in order to ensure that none of the next N epochs are finalized on time, the attacker just needs to ensure that no two epochs in a row are justified. So what that boils down to is uh, calculating the probability that a biased coin with probability heads equals 0.91 and probability tails equals 0.09, that over the course of the next n flips of that biased coin, there's no two heads in a row. And we can calculate that probability directly. And again, here, cost is the amount of reward lost or the opportunity cost of playing a dishonest strategy. So yeah, that's all I had. Again, I presented Ethereum proof of stake and our two attacks, which allow an attacker to execute malicious reorgs and delay finality. There's a lot of future work in, in terms of this project specifically, we could think about quantifying the impact of these attacks. So saying, given that an attacker is playing the reorg strategy, how much can they expect to earn? Um, how much can they expect to earn by, by playing the strategy? And finally, considering how to mitigate these attacks is also a very interesting line of future work. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.